Ever hear of Clyde Beatty? Well, he was the secret to the Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey's most popular act, the Wild Animal Tamer. Today on Through the Bible, we'll learn Clyde Beatty's secret of taming a lion. But what we learn from our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, will be far more important for us. He says, you can tame a lion, you can tame an elephant, but you can't tame the little tongue. Welcome to Through the Bible. I'm your host, Steve Schwetz, and by far the best thing that we hear today is that only a regenerate tongue in a redeemed body, a tongue that God has tamed, can be used for Him. That's what I want. I want a wild heart and a wild tongue that God has tamed, and He still has a little bit of work to do on my end. And what about you? Now, before we jump into our great study of James chapter 3 today, Greg and I have a quick update from our world prayer team. Steve, today the World Prayer Team is praying our way through Albania, which is in southern Europe, uh, which is the region that we're praying through all week. And And I don't know if very many people know that 70% of the population in Albania is Muslim. I know. And that's very extraordinary because it was one of the most hardline communist countries under the Iron Curtain, which, of course, the the philosophy was to obliterate all religions. So it's very interesting that 70 percent today, as you said, of Albanians are Muslim. And many towns and villages, because of that, have no church, no Christian presence. And that makes our broadcast presence there even more critical. And as you pray for this ministry in Albania, you can pray for Akil Pano. He's our producer. And here's an example of a listener to that ministry. I am a new pastor in a suburb area of Tirana. This is from Ania, by the way. The neighborhood where I and my wife serve is very poor. Many people have moved from the north of Albania and have come to live there, but they don't have an education or a job. Since I was a student, I have been blessed by your programs. I have listened online and on the radio. I have learned so many things. Now that I am leading this new church, I am encouraging the people to listen to your program along with me. That's such a common thing that we hear. Mm -hmm. They are great because even if they don't know how to read, listening to the clear gospel reaches their heart. Thank you for this wonderful instruction. We are in need of God's Word, and you are bringing it to us. And Steve, we always love to hear that God is using us to equip the equippers to help pastors be better teachers and minister to their congregations. Now, here's a great response from Jonah. She writes, I've attended church since I was five years old, but I started to understand more about faith when I was 16. Around that time, I went through lots of difficulties in my life and my family. I tried to find my worth and my identity. I looked everywhere. That's when I started to go to church again, hoping to reconnect with the God that I heard about in my childhood. During this process of learning to know God, your programs played an important role. I listened to them and studied for hours and hours for months. I wrote notes and prayed along with the speaker. Even though I was going to church meetings, that wasn't enough. I needed to learn more about God. I was thirsty. Hmm. Oh, we love it when we hear yeah, listeners well say said. they're thirsty. The, she goes on, At that specific time in my life, your studies were the only thing with meaning. Each message has been like a school for me. Even after great suffering, I still believe Jesus is my God, and this is because of your programs. My faith is rooted in Jesus. I will be forever grateful for Through the Bible. I'm sorry that I'm writing only after so many years. Blessings and warm hugs to all of you who work and pray for such a great program to reach us here in Albania. Let's pray as we begin our study. Heavenly Father, we pray for Jonah and for so many listeners in Albania that you would continue to teach them through your word, that you would draw more people to yourself because of the program. Pray that you would bless our study in the word today. In Jesus' name, amen. Now here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, if there ever was a message that gets down to the nitty-gritty, it's this message here that deals with the tongue, because most of us find ourselves in this spot here where we recognize that the tongue gets us into trouble, and the tongue reveals who we are. Now, last time, James used the figure of speech of putting bits in the mouth of a horse, and the ship is guided with a very small rudder, a great ship is, and the tongue today, a tongue should be controlled like that, 
And he says in verse 5, where we begin today, even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. Now, the tongue can really get us into trouble. No question about that. And someone again has put it in words like this. A careless word may kindle strife. A cruel word may wreck a life. A bitter word may hate instill. A brutal word may smite and kill. A gracious word may smooth the way. A joyous word may light the day. A timely word may lessen stress. A loving word may heal and bless. So today we need to recognize the importance of the tongue. It's all important. It actually tells who we are and reveals who we are. Many years ago, in fact, it was right after World War II, and it was when General Montgomery of the Eighth Army in Italy, and he was that great British commander, he made a statement to the army before he left. He said to the army and all of his generals who were there, he says, command must be personal and it must be verbal. Otherwise, it will have no success because it's wrapped up in the human factor. Continuing on, he said this, I often have at the back of my mind a passage from the New Testament, except ye utter by the tongue words that are easy to be understood. How shall it be known what is spoken? That is 1 Corinthians 14, 9. And that's the kind of tongue I want to speak in today, is a tongue that the little child, and I have letters from children, and that the older ones can. And as someone said, how in the world could that same message have brought a nine-year-old child to the Lord and at the same time brought a professor at the University of Ohio. I don't know. I must confess, I don't know. But I do believe that God blesses his word, and it must be taught simply. Now, he goes on here to say something else about the tongue. He says, and the tongue, verse 6 now, chapter 3 of James, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among your members that it defileth the whole body and it's set on fire, the course of nature, and it's set on fire of hell. Now, this is something that I think is quite impressive, my friend, that the tongue is compared to a forest fire. I don't know whether you've ever seen a forest fire or not, but here in California, they're very devastating, absolutely, in many cases, uncontrolled. They have to burn themselves out in most cases. Now, fire has been, of course, one of the greatest friends of man and nature. In fact, the evolutionist likes to say that the dawn of civilization came when man found out he could use fire. When it was under control, it could warm our bodies, it cooks our food, and it's tragedy, though, when a house is on fire. But when fire is under control, it makes power to turn wheels. The danger is when it's out of control. And you hear a fire siren rushing through the night. And you know there are a group of men making a frantic effort to put it out. Present civilization, even today, is not able to control the fire. The London fire in 1666 destroyed London. Mrs. O'Leary's cow kicked over a lantern in Chicago and started it there. And yet today we see great devastation caused in our day. And as we've said, some historians say civilization began when man discovered fire. Now the tongue is like a fire. When it's under control, it's a blessing. When it's out of control, it's a blight. It can be a cure or it can be a curse. In Proverbs 12, verse 18, there is that that speaketh like the piercing of a sword, but the tongue of the wise is health. Tongue can be like a sword, kill you. 
but it also can be health itself. What a picture this is of the tongue. And again, in Proverbs 15, 14, the heart of him that hath understanding seeketh knowledge, but the mouth of fools feedeth on foolishness. And now, the proverb I think I've given you before, thou art master of the unspoken word, but the spoken word is master of you. If you haven't said it, you can't be held responsible, but once you've said it, why, I tell you, it's been said. Like the mistake I made some time ago, and it really was a slip of the tongue because I used the wrong man for General Nathan Bedford Forrest is the one who said, who gets there the fastest with the mostest. I made a blunder at that time, and it was a slip of the tongue, you see. And you remember that man, Simon Peter, his tongue betrayed him, but he denied he knew his Lord. But on the day of Pentecost, who was it that the Lord used? That blundering, stumbling, bumbling fella, Simon Peter. Now, forest and brush fires, they scorch, they blacken, they're a plague. And a tongue can burn through a church, or burn through a community, burn through a town, and even burn through a nation. Now, when it says it's set on fire of hell, there are those that have questioned my use of that word in the title of my book, that this is not the proper translation. The Greek word here is Gehenna. It's not Sheol. Actually, this is the correct word for hell. It is the same thing that you find in Revelation as the lake of fire. And here it's the valley of Hinnom where the fire never went out. And this word is only used 12 times in the New Testament. And the Lord Jesus is the one who used it 11 times. And James used it only one time in right here. And this is a correct translation. The tongue set on fire of hell. Now we're not through with the tongue. Notice verse 7 here. For every kind of beasts and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed by mankind, but the tongue can no man tame. It's an unruly evil full of deadly poison. I remember several years ago when I was much younger and before I was married, a group of us young folk, including some of the young couples, when a circus would come to town, while we would go out at night to some home and have a time of fellowship, and then we would have a late dinner, and then we'd go down to the railroad yards for the circus to come in, and we'd watch the circus unload. And the parade of moving it out to the circus grounds was in progress, and we'd go along with it, and we'd watch them put up the tent. One morning, we were invited to have breakfast with them in the cook tent. My, what a thrill it was. And then they would generally put up the tent where the animals were. That's where you entered the circus. And Clyde Beatty, who had had his own circus for a long time, why, he was then with the Ringland brothers, Barnum and Bailey, and he had charge of the wild animals. And he was the one who went in the cage and put them through their paces. And we were in that tent, not at that time as paid customers, but we're just watching them put up everything. Clyde Beatty went to a cage in which there were some little lion cubs. I think there were three or four of them. He took them out and began to play with them there. He would roll them and they would bite at him and he would grab them and turn them over and just having a big time with them. And we went over and asked him the question of why he did that. He said, I would never go in a cage with a lion that I had not brought up from the time it was a cub because you can't train an old lion. And I begin with these little ones. And when they grow up in a fierce, fine-looking young lions, and they didn't use old lions then, Clyde Beatty didn't, he said, I put these fierce-looking lions in the cage, but he said, they know me, and I know them. May I say to you, you can tame a lion, you can tame an elephant, but you can't tame the little tongue. 
One little animal, no zoo has in captivity. No circus can make it perform. The tongue can no man tame. Only a regenerate tongue in a redeemed body that God has tamed can be used for him. And have you ever noticed that Paul said that we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth? The Lord Jesus said, we're to sing a duet and it's to be in tune. The Lord Jesus said, what's in the heart's going to come out. Somebody's put it like this. What is in the well of the heart will come out through the bucket of the mouth. And you're going to say it sooner or later. And have you ever noticed the man that Christ touched his tongue? I thought that was always a very wonderful thing, that the Lord Jesus touched his tongue. Now, let's come on down here because we're not quite through here. He says, verse 9, Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men who are made after the image of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Now, the tongue that you and I have is capable of praising God or blaspheming God. The tongue is what lifts man above the animal world. Man, as we've said, is not a gibbering ape. Man's not a mockingbird either. Man can communicate with man, and he can communicate with God. And when a man on Sunday can sing like an angel and then talk like a demon during the week, well, you label him. The Bible calls him a hypocrite. You can call him anything that you want to. I had a marvelous experience of that when I announced in the bank I worked that I was going to study for the ministry. The vice president, one of them, called me in, and he'd been a good friend of mine. He knew something of my life and how I'd lived. And he said, Vernon, I hope you're going to be a genuine preacher and a genuine servant of God. He says, the reason today I'm not a Christian is because of an experience I had during the war. Now, this is World War I. He said that they set up a bank out at the old powder plant at Old Hickory out of Nashville, Tennessee. And it was a branch bank, and they had difficulty balancing out there. One of the tellers was a soloist in one of the downtown churches in Nashville. And he said one day that he came out of the church, and one of the ladies there that had heard him sing a solo said, you know, that man's the most wonderful man in the world. He sings just like an angel. And this vice president didn't say anything. But that woman had business at the bank out at Old Hickory. She had property there. And she came out one day, and that man was a teller in the bank out there. And so this man who was vice president, he was talking to this lady, and all of a sudden they heard the vilest language he said he thinks he'd ever heard came from this teller who was the soloist at this church. He attempted to balance, and he didn't balance, and I was a teller for several years, and I know that's just about as discouraging as anything that can happen to you. You know you've got to go back over the whole transaction of the day. And this man began to rip out a blasphemy after, and this lady says, who in the world is that? And he says, why, that's that soloist that sings like an angel on Sunday. A man can bless God with his mouth, or he can blaspheme God. You can do one of the two with the mouth you got. And the Lord Jesus says what's in the heart's going to be coming up through the mouth. That tongue's going to say it. Now, verse 11, doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter water? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either a vine, figs, so can no fountain yield both salt water and fresh. In other words, a man can be two-faced. He can be double-minded and a forked tongue individual. He can say good and bad. But no fountain down here is going to give forth both sweet and bitter. And a tree won't bear figs and olives. I don't know whether you could bud one on the other or not, but it would have to be an unnatural growth. But some people, they've been grafted, and graft is a good word, by the way, for them. They can praise God on Sunday. Now, the tongue reveals genuine faith, by the way. 
because with the mouth confession is made of that which is in the heart. Verse 13, who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you, let him show out of a good life his works with meekness and wisdom. You see, the tongue can reveal genuine faith. It can give a testimony for God. It can speak wisdom. Now, verse 14, but if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. Now, strife and bitterness are not the fruits of faith at all. And the tongue, you see, can stir that sort of thing up. And he's making now a contrast between what the tongue does and the tongue of even a foolish believer and the tongue of a wise believer. In fact, an uncontrolled tongue today raises the question in any man's mind of whether he's a child of God or not. You can't make me believe that you can cuss six days a week and then sing in choir on Sunday. I don't think you can. You can't tell dirty jokes and then teach a Sunday school class and tell about the love of Jesus on Sunday. That tongue you've got, my friend, can do either one. But if it does both, it is that which stirs up strife. And we're told here, lie not against the truth. And a lying tongue is one that denies the Lord during the week by his conversation. Now, verse 15, he says, This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, demoniacal. Now, in other words, what he's making here very clear is these things do not originate from God, and it comes not from him at all. It's earthly, it's sensual, and it's demoniacal. You know, knowledge is proud that she's learned so much. Wisdom is humble that she knows no more. The wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, and demoniacal, you see. For where envy and strife are, there is confusion and every evil work. And we're going to deal with this in the next chapter because he's going to define to us what worldliness really is and what a shock that's going to be to a lot of people. Verse 17, but the wisdom that is from above it's first pure. It's not mingled a mix. It's no mixture. It's pure. It's the original. Then peaceable. And actually, the thought is that out from the pure comes peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. These are verses that do not need very much elucidation at all. Dr. Samuel Zwamer mentions the fact that false teaching always produces strife and envy and trouble. He said this, you cannot explain the wickedness of the world as merely human. It is human plus something. And that is why non-Christian religions are successful. They are supernatural, but from beneath. And anything that causes division and strife, and I don't care whose church it's in, it's not of the Lord. You may be sure of that, and you may boast of fundamentalism, but if you're causing strife, I want to tell you, you got up the wrong flag. Now he says, the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by them that make peace. Now, that'll be enlarged upon in the next chapter. So until then, may God richly bless you. Well, no one is able to tame their tongue on their own, but God can when he redeems us and gives us new life in Christ. In that case, the tongue can reveal genuine faith and it can also do great good, as we'll hear in tomorrow's study. If we can help you find a resource by Dr. McGee to deepen your own study of God's Word, or if you'd like to find out how you can partner with us to keep the Bible bus traveling the world in more than 120 languages and dialects, call 1-800-65-BIBLE or visit ttb.org. As we go, let me remind you that by far the most important, life-changing decision that you can ever make is to embrace Jesus as your Savior and the Lord of your life. 
Without this, nothing makes sense until the one who made you also rules over your heart and life. The next step, and for the rest of your life, is to discover the wonder and mysteries in God's Word. We together, in that journey on the Bible bus, are growing from glory to glory, as 2 Corinthians 3.18 tells us. You know, this glory of God in our lives spills over to others, too. And I want to thank you for your investment in eternal projects happening at Through the Bible. God uses your prayer and financial support to continue this mission that literally goes as deep as the human spirit and as wide as the four corners of the world. This is Steve Schwetz. For all of us at Through the Bible, we're grateful for your company on the Bible bus and your partnership in taking the whole word to the whole world. To be my own sin had left a crimson stain. Our study today was made possible through your prayer and financial support. We'll meet you back here next time. In fact, we're going to do this together, Lord willing, till Jesus comes again. In which case, we'll meet you in the air.